Okay, everybody, we're ready. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you. My name is Pierre Geronimo. I'm the CEO of uh, GR Mobility, Geneva Relocation, for those who, who know us uh, a bit locally. So I'm here with my team, uh, Doreen, where is Doreen? Doreen Bantezeli, who is the head of operation. We have Elena Arnes, who is one of our senior account yes. manager, and uh, Francis Doherty, who is uh, in charge of immigration and sales development. And our community manager, Mr. Social Media, Thomas, who is going to record the presentation, so you'll be able to share. You have already the printed version, but you can see it's live on, uh, on video. So thank you for being here tonight. Before I, uh, I hand over to um, Anne-Laure, I would like to thank um, NetExpat and EY for this great survey that has been uh, uh, carried out. And we are very pleased to, I think since this year, to enter into a what we call a strategic partnership uh, between uh, NetExpact and uh, Geneva Relocation. So we know each other for quite a long time, probably more than 15 years. Um, so it's a very close relationship uh, between uh, NetExpact and, uh, and us. And before I hand over to Anne-Laure, I would like to tell you that after this presentation, we have to take the elevator, go to the eighth floor, where we'll have some drinks and some food with a nice view, well, over Geneva. So we are cordially inviting you to attend uh, this uh, networking apéro uh, and join us for, for discussion after this presentation. Thank you again for being here. Now I hand over to Anne-Laure. Thank you, Pierre. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here with you. Thank you for coming. So we are really delighted, very happy to make the restitution of this uh, Global Relocating Partner Survey. Uh, this has been launched last year in 2017 together with EY and today is a, well, it's a survey of reference. So you will discover with Ralph and uh, Ralph from EY and Dominique from NetExpat. Dominique is a senior consultant at NetExpat. You will discover why, and why the spouse is so important in a, relocate, in a relocation process. From the start, in the home country, the, the spouse needs to be reassured, and then in the host country also needs to be occupied to do something. So um, I'm the regional director of NetExpat, and I'm very, I will be very happy to network and to discuss with you after, during the networking session. Thank you very much, Anna. So we, we're going to have an, um, a present, well, you have the, the presentation. The brochure that you have on your table is for you to take away with. The presentation that you'll see here uh, will email you uh, because we all have your email address. There's some, some um, obviously the data is the same, but the way it's presented uh, is a bit different, and that's something that you can also share with your colleagues back at work. Um, or to convince your management that now is the time to do something about the partner support. Uh, we'll leave enough time to take your questions. So if anything pops up in your mind, don't wait the end. We've got ample time. We have the whole building for ourselves, so we can take the night, <laughs> more or less. But we have enough time for the presentation and for the questions. So when you see something that, re that you know, triggers a question or comment, you don't have to wait until the end. If that's okay with you, Ron? Well, we didn't agree with that. We are it flexible. Depends, we are always we are flexible. flexible. It all depends on the audience. Okay. Mm. So I'll leave it good. to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, and good evening, everybody. My name is Ralf Pavelik, uh, partner at EY, People Advisory Services here in, in Geneva, um, Route de Chancy. Um, welcome you to this uh, uh, presentation around the, the survey, and Anne Law, uh, you already mentioned this. This was a a, a large piece of work over the last six months in year 2017 where we surveyed um, over 3,400 people um, to get insights about relocating partners. And this is probably the, the largest survey uh, possibly ever uh, on this uh, topic around partner trends. So 3,400 respondents, we had people from over 120 countries over 80 nationalities, 320 corporations. So we had multinationals, uh, but also international governmental organizations because we wanted to have insights on this topic also from the 
public sector. So we have both here the, the private and the, and the public sector. So really uh, a, a great effort, probably the largest um, ever survey. And what makes it unique is that we have surveyed the partner itself because who best to ask than the, uh, the, the partners that are uh, going on assignment with their, with their spouses. So we have asked over 1,000 partners um, about their uh, thoughts around uh, uh, accompanying the, um, uh, the assignees. It was interesting what we found out, and also that the assignees themselves, they were quite concerned, and they have been quite harsh, quite critical with their employers uh, around what they would expect for, as a, a kind of a support. Um, what was unique also about this uh, report is that um, we had, if we go through the, I don't know if we can do this here. Oh, yes. Here we go. Oh, it goes like this. Okay, you will see this on the slides um, that we will present. There's benchmark data and survey data. So um, we have surveyed 3,400 people. Basically, that was an anonymous uh, survey we sent round. And in addition to that, we have identified stakeholders within HR, uh, typically policy owners um, that are well aware about the programs around partners, uh, relocating partners. And we have received their responses as well, and which gives us now a, a really fair overview on how these stakeholders view uh, a partner support that should, that should occur. So many of you, um, many of your companies, maybe not you personally, have contributed in this report. So there's a um, a wide range of, of, of companies, basically, uh, you see some here, um, that have uh, contributed here. What you see here is the, the first question um, about the decision making. A, a lot of times we underestimate that at the time, from an HR standpoint, when you talk to your employees about going on an assignment, there's the decision making um, factors that come into the game. And that's when the partner is should be involved. What you see here is that um, most of the time, if I take my here, sorry, here, oops, voila, uh, is the the discussion is actually taking place beforehand. Now that seems obvious and basic, but um, in my previous life, when I was an HR person, sometimes it did happen that the assignment was starting. And the partner was basically informed shortly before the move was there. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, but we're going to Singapore, we're going to Nigeria, and so on. Um, the discussion was not there that much. Now, with the generation and with the kind of transfer that is happening, it's not always long term, can be short term. Um, the different solutions may happen as well in terms of commuting, going short term, or having the family in one country and the expat or the employee in another country, that requires some, some discussion. And it's not only when you have children that this kind of discussion is happening. So what in, in the arrow that you see here is um, the involvement, and the 9.1 means it's, it's happening almost 100%, 91% to be precise. So there are still some cases where discussion and, and decision is not yet uh, purely aligned, but when you look some years ago, it was definitely not that much. Um, now, the, to the question, do you feel that your current employer is paying enough attention to the partner support? What is really interesting is where each of the population is standing on the arrow. And that's quite frightening when you're on an HR standpoint, because if you look at the HR answer, it's either 56 or 64, but if you look where the mobile employee and the partner stand. The gap is where there is something that needs to be closed somewhere. You can't have an HR population and say, well, everything is going not great, but there's some good actions, and yes, there is a gap, but a manageable gap. But if you look at the mobile employee and the partner, the distortion is quite important. And I, I was really surprised to see how you know, I was expecting a difference, but that much is really striking. And if you look at the mobile employee, there's even more the impression, the feeling that the partner is left out. 
but also there is some connection or some miscommunication between the partner and the employee, you might, um, you might think. So there's definitely something that needs to be worked on, and that's, that's why we need to do something about it. Ralph? Yeah. This is when we go to the next, uh, to the next uh, question. Maybe the, the, the take the next because this yeah. is more the sector thing. Um, it, 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 this really struck me. This is when we asked, uh, what is the main common reason why um, international assignments fail? Um, not certainly not an an easy uh, a question to to answer. Um, how do you measure success? What is a failure? Um, when is a, an assignment successful? But failure was was uh, really the, the most common reason here was clearly. Uh, because uh, the partner is not happy. So it's not about uh, uh, packages, it's not about the performance, it's not about the destination country, it's about uh, unhappy uh, partners. So this is really uh, a key finding and I think really um, shows how, how critical this, this topic is because the, the percentage that you see with over 70%, I think it's 71% of the respondents told us that this was the case. So if we go to the next slide, we will see that, um, and if you go really take, take a step back and look at why do um, employees accept or do not accept an international assignments, typically what we see, the main reason is that for not accepting it, that the partner is not willing to move and uh, has a career. So again, uh, uh, very, very striking, and you see that in, in particular the female colleagues um, that are shown here in orange um, uh, uh, have difficulties in, in moving the, the male <laughs> colleagues. So is this because we're still in the traditional scheme that it's more difficult to move uh, the male partner because he has uh, the, 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 the job in the home country, uh, maybe higher income or so? Anyhow, it's, it's, it's a quite a clear response here. And how important it is. Um, it's not when you you would expect that people would discuss around salaries, about destination country, upcoming job. No, basically what your assignees typically would uh, uh, discuss, it's about the career of the spouse. Can I just add something, Paul? If you look at, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, that the partner is unwilling to move, but not because of career, that's quite striking as well. Sometimes we put on the career from the partner the excuse or the reason for not going, but there's much more behind that. Can be culture, can be safety, can be the fact that in the country of assignment, the partner is not going to find the place, you know, in terms of integration or adding value to the community where he or she will be based. Um, so it's not always the career. Of course, we think about dual careers, except, uh, you know, increasing. Um, reason for failure, but it's not only that. And, and for those who have been exposed to dealing with families and couples moving around in an assignment, um, you end up having to deal with disconnects and, and with communication issues, um, whether it's between HR and the employee or the employee and his or her partner. Um, at the end of the day, it's not a win-win situation, it's a lose-lose situation. The family loses, the company loses, um, and that costs a lot of money and can cost not only money, but also um, family situation, divorce, or, or really tense situation. So if you look at the potential impacts and not a return on investment, we talk about adding value and creating value in companies more and more, this is clearly a, a, a good or a solid uh, reason for not destroying value but creating value by ensuring that the assignment goes well from the beginning and before the assignment and not once you have tension and problems in the host country. So if we look at what happened to, uh, to the next slide, um, what happened before the assignment, we will see that 77%, I think it is, 77% of partners worked before, um, before, uh, 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 before the assignment. So that's quite a, an, an impressive number. It's a li little bit less for baby boomers, where we have two-thirds, roughly, so a little bit less. But when you go to next generation, generation Y, we typically see that over 90% of the, 
of, of, of dual careers. So basically, ni over 90% uh, where both partners are, are working. So a clear expectation to find a job also on assignment. By the way, nowadays, what we found is that two-thirds of the spouses, of the partners, are working on assignment or have the intention to work, are looking for a job on assignment. So really clear statement here. Maybe to the next, it's, it's an uh, evolution we see. Over the, when we surveyed the HR professionals here, and you see this is benchmark data, so coming directly from HR, we saw that over the last five years, there's a clear tendency um, that we have more and more working towards non-working spouses. So you see that um, over 60%, I think it is here, um, of the respondents replied that, yes, this is the case. More and more uh, uh, working spouses we see. Whereas only 2% said the number of working spouses is less. So a, a clear tendency here. And the reason is pretty obvious, and this we will see on the, on the next slide. When it comes to the question, what is the, um, the importance of income earned throughout, uh, uh, not necessarily throughout the uh, uh, assignment, but importance of the income generated by partners, we found that nearly 70% of respondents said that the importance is critical or significant. So clearly here, an expectation, a need also to kind of uh, focus on the income of the partner. And when we go to the next slide, we'll see that um, the reasons that partners want to work abroad is the income, particularly for males. So this goes together, we think, also with the fact that the packages are less generous. It's not that in the past where we saw like generous packages, expat went over, the partner was just following and said, okay, we can live on your, on your salary because it's that generous. Now that's not the case anymore. So there's a need for the partner also to contribute to the income of the couple. Interesting also that females put a stronger focus of career enrichment compared to income, whereas the males seem to be more focused on the money. Slightly. Well. <laughs> Other reasons also uh, why, why partners want to work, like um, staying busy, experience, integration, and others. Any questions so far, or surprises? Does it fit with your intuition, or what you live on a daily basis? Yeah. Okay. So if we look at the supports, um, the good news is not ninety percent of the companies that we survey, so the three thousand plus plus, um, do you offer some form of support to the partners. Now, if you remember some years ago when we offered support, um, it was basically learning the language of the host country. Now, we would all agree that learning the language of the host country would not get you a job. If that was so easy, we would not have so much struggle. But um, yes, they do offer some sort of support, but based on the, how critical it is to get talent moving around to assume responsibilities in host countries, uh, we have to make sure that for income reason, for career reason, for international experience, or to add value, some, some sort of support needs to be given on top of just learning the language. Um, so on the, on the definition of, of uh, benefits in terms of um, the, the vocabulary that you'll find in the, in the survey, and if you look at over here, this is again benchmark data, 77% um, of companies recognize that uh, partners, whether it's, it's not only the traditional married people, but it's also those who are partners, whether it's same sex or opposite sex. So it's becoming more and more um, normal, if, if, if I'd say, for companies. It depends, of course, on the host location. In, in, in some location, it's more or less accepted and easy, but the fact within companies, within corporation, the traditional couple um, is now extended over to more situations. Very shortly, um, not the most important, but by industry, I, you'll see that um, partner support is um, often 
uh, 100% in the FMCG financial services more often, um, whether in the IT world it's a bit less, although significant still. And you might uh, probably guess that in the IT sector it's also a question of generation, so younger people. Um, the objective of the support policy is the assignment satisfaction. So when you remember of the first slides that we saw as one of the biggest reasons for failure, obviously the, most, the, the biggest reason to offer support is to make sure that the partner is happy um, before, during, and um, over time, um, but also facilitate the acceptance. It has happened more and more often that simply your star or the high potential that you um, have in mind to move abroad doesn't go simply because the partner would not accept in the beginning. So you're torn between I go without my partner or I respect his or her decision. Increased job performance, it's so common sense, but when you're happy in, at home, then it's easy to be happy at work and to be able to be fully devoted to your job. When you come back home and your partner feel miserable, not integrated, doesn't know how to find a job and so on, doesn't make your job as an employee easier. So you need to have some kind of support to make sure that the partner you're helping or in supporting will find the job or the activity that will make that partner happy in the host city or country. So finding a job can be the solution, but to find a job requires some thinking behind to make sure that the transferable skills from, from the, the past life can be transferred in the host country, or that the person is creating his or her own company or contributing to the city. So there's different ways you can be integrated. Work permit supports, integration, education allowance, these are the usual ones but it's worth to highlight that this is, this is the increasing one, and one that was probably will be the most sustainable in making sure that the spouse is happy and your employee is ha happy as well. So when there are some review, some of the, uh, and that's very good news, a big focus is giving on better communication. Sometimes uh, when we talk to our HR colleagues, um, there are, some misunderstanding that when we communicate through the assignment letter or the package and so on, we say, well, but we told them, we communicated, we told them that there were supports available, but when you give, you know, if you, how many of you have been expat in their life? How many of you have moved? You moved a few times? Mm -hmm. And Lo, Francis, Peter? Now, you too. So when you move, You've got lots of things to think about. You've got the move on the way. You've got all the paperwork to do. You think about what's going to happen to you next. <coughs> you think about what has happened to you so far. You think about many things, whether it's logistics, family, or the toys of the kids that need to be put in boxes so that they arrive safely. Lots of things. So when the HR department gives a pack of paper and documents to your spouse at work, it doesn't guarantee that the information gets to you to start with, and second, that you remember, and then you understand what partner support means. And, and that's a lot of organizations now realize that more communication or better communication or more frequent communication should happen. Visibility of support, that it's visible to the partner and not only to the employee. Um, increase in terms of the benefit itself, and the partner involvement, whether in the decision and the assignment, to shift cash from benefits, you know, tangible benefits like helping to find a job, um, and start offering it because sometimes it was just language training, which is not really partner support, is as such to find a job. Now, the, the split family assignments um, was a question as well in terms of how um, challenging it is. Now, you have a few, a few industries on, on the right-hand side, but, um, I mean, the big red is 77% is quite high. Um, by experience, split family can work for a number of months, 
or weeks, but yours always end up. I mean, I've, I've never uh, experienced a, a happy ending when you have split assignment for a long time. So usually it would work for two months, three months, six months, um, but more than a year is a very tough one. So that's, that's the 77% um, confirmed, that's what we know. Uh, in terms of the conclusion, the, the, the highlight or the main messages are here on that slide. Um, <coughs> integrate talent management with mobility is crucial if we want to align the career objectives. Make sure that the partner is involved from the early stage, from the decision making, from the support, from keep contact with your expats one, once they are there. Um, learn more about the solution, the different solutions that exist, and Anlo is going to briefly talk about what net expat can do for the partners of your employees. Um, we're happy to help if you have any question for those of you who change the policy to see what you know what are the trends. Net expat is present globally, worldwide, everywhere. So we have enough knowledge and enough best practice um, policy practices that we can happily share with you so that it's aligned with your industry, with your business, with your context, uh, but from an external standpoint. Um, and, and we organize on a regular basis every six months, once in spring, once in autumn, uh, best practice breakfast. Some of you have come to our best practice breakfast. This is a great way to see what's going on also in other companies and see whether you can uh, exchange some good ideas from other companies' best practices. We can benchmark within your industry if you wish to so that you have some more material to um, talk to your management. Uh, so that's the first phase, the data collection. Uh, we'll uh, prepare the data so that it makes sense to you in terms of internal benchmark, but also so that you can have the data that is proper to your company. Um, and uh, we can help you in, in improving or enhancing what you offer to your expats and their families so that the return on investment that you don't yet measure uh, is getting the results and that the money that you're investing in your talents when you move them around um, is done properly and to your benefit and to their benefits and nobody loses. So if you're interested, we're here after during the drinks. Don't hesitate if you want to benchmark yourself. Um, it's free, so you can use the data and make it yours. Yeah, so you, you can survey uh, the, the expatriate, mm -hmm. the local HR, uh, and you can survey also your own policy and compare it uh, with the rest of your industry. And it's a good way to communicate based on data. Sometimes mm -hmm. in HR, what we, we, we know there are some issues because we get the feedback from either employees or their partners or both at the same time. But that really allows you to use the data to talk to your management. And when you make suggestions for improvements, you have, it's backed up with data that is really is not an HR intuition or a feeling but it's something that we, you can use um, to make improvement that will give you a good return on your investment, whether it's time investment or money investment. So the relocating partner may be a little bit anxious about this move, and this is fully understandable. So uh, that's why at NetExpat, we support globally in 82, in 82 countries relocating partner. For those who want to work, of course, we can support them locally with job search coaching. So we have different types of coaching. We have tools, methodology, uh, great coach, of course, in all these countries, such as Dominique uh, in Geneva. Yes, in a previous survey, it was from uh, Permits Foundation. I don't know if you know Permits Foundation. It's a big international organization based in the Netherlands, and they do lobbying in order to facilitate the, the work of the relocating spouse. And in this survey, uh, Permits Foundation said that 80% of the spouse wanted to have the choice to work or not. 
So it means that not all the spouses want to work, but they want to have the choice. So once you propose them an international assignment, they are happy. And if you tell them, well, if you want to be supported in the host country, you can be, so the spouse will say, oh, yes, that's nice. And th this is really what they say. That's nice. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I will work, maybe not. I will wait after a few times. But I know that I can be supported in the host country. And this is very important so, to facilitate a move and to make a success of an expatriation, not only upon departure, but also upon return. Because the spouse will have worked, will have been active, it will be easier. So if you have a similar case, if you want to support the spouse of your expatriate, so we will always organize a, a free and non-binding orientation call and we can tell them if they can work or not because it starts like that, uh, if it's legally permitted, uh, and then uh, we will see. <laughs>